Hey, 42 here. Jesus Christ, Nelson Mandela, and Adolf Hitler. Aside from being costumes guaranteed to cause a stir at a fancy dress party, these historic heavyweights all have something in common. They were all leaders of such passion, conviction, and charisma that they could compel their followers to do things, both good and evil, they would otherwise never have considered. Today's story of madness, mock messiahs, and mass murder focuses on someone who combined elements of all three. He was a captivating preacher with the gift of the gab, a firebrand political leader who advocated radical socialism and racial harmony, and a tyrant who used violence and death to achieve his aims. Rising to prominence during the era of peace and love, he eventually declared himself to be the messiah but instead turned out to be a very naughty boy. After brainwashing his thousands of followers into giving up their money and freedom, he eventually cost them their lives by engineering what is to this day the largest mass suicide in modern history. This is the twisted tale of Jim Jones, a self-styled prophet who mixed spirituality with criminality and convinced his congregation he would give them heaven on earth, but instead brought about his own personal apocalypse. <laughs> now let's be honest, most of us drink a little more than we should. And as I get older, bouncing back the next day isn't as easy as it used to be. But recently, I've been trying something new. Introducing Z-Biotics, the world's first genetically engineered probiotic designed by PhD scientists to tackle those rough mornings after drinking. Here's the science behind it. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break down this byproduct. It's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut where you need it the most. Just remember to drink Zbiotics before drinking alcohol, drink responsibly, and get a good night's sleep to feel your best the next day. I recently tried Zbiotics before I went out for an Italian meal with some friends, an event that I knew would involve more than one bottle of wine. I drank a bottle of Zbiotics before consuming any alcohol, and I was honestly amazed at how good I felt the next day. So go to zbiotics.com 42 and get 15% off your first order using the code 42 at checkout. You can also sign up for a subscription using my code so you can be prepared for any occasion. Zbiotics is backed with a 100% money back guarantee, so if you're unsatisfied for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, head to zbiotics.com 42 and use the code 42 at checkout for 15% off. A big thank you to Zbiotics for sponsoring this video. Jones was born into abject misery in rural Indiana in May 1931. His father was crippled in World War I and struggled to find work, and his mother had all the maternal instincts of a frog with amnesia. The family were evicted during the Great Depression of the 30s, relocating into what was little more than a shack with no indoor plumbing or electricity. Things got so bad they were forced to forage for food in nearby fields, Jim is left to his own devices from a very young age. He frequently toddled through town naked as an infant because there was no one around to dress him. At some point in his childhood, he was given a Bible by the wife of a local pastor, and it turned out to be a lightning bolt moment for the oft-nude infant. He studied the book ceaselessly and began to attend multiple churches every week, getting baptised in several of them. Religion and death fascinated Jones, even then. He gave sermons to the local kids and held mock funerals for roadkill. He also claimed to have special powers, on one occasion swearing blind he could fly, a boast that was proven a lie shortly afterwards when he jumped off a roof and broke his arm. When he wasn't reading the Bible, Jones was engrossed in works by the likes of Stalin, Mao and Gandhi. If it isn't obvious already, he was far from your average kid. Instead of comic books and candy, it was more communism and cat funerals. When World War II broke out, Jones's new Nazi fascination surprised no one. He commanded the neighborhood children to goose step in time with him on pretend marches and beat them if they refused. Between the roadkill funerals and enforced fascism, Jones had done little to endear himself to his school friends 
and this pattern persisted into puberty. He went full briefcase wanker by wearing his Sunday church clothes to school, regularly lecturing his fellow students about the dangers of the free Ds, drinking, dancing, and the biggest D of them all, the devil. Unless your idea of a good time was linking arms and reading psalms, Jim Jones was definitely not the guy to get stuck with at a house party. At college, he became increasingly politically active and started attending Communist Party meetings. This was America in the 50s, and the Red Scare was in full effect. Merely being suspected of sympathising with the Communists could get you blacklisted by the government. Considering that Jones and his young wife Marcelin actually were commies, it's no surprise they were regularly harassed by the FBI. You could say they exhibited a few red flags. But these ideological intrusions only served to further radicalise the young couple. In the early 50s, Jones worked as a pastor at several churches across Indianapolis. And in 1955, he founded the now infamous People's Temple. It was supposed to be a new religious movement that combined Christianity with communism. But, as we'll soon discover, it rapidly devolved into one of history's deadliest doomsday cults. To gain more followers in those early years, Jones organised faith healing conventions, during which he would call upon the big man upstairs to do a spot of divine doctoring, healing various ailments amongst the attendees. It worked too. Not the healing, obviously. The getting more followers bit. Despite his earlier admiration for a certain tiny moustached German, Jones went on to become an advocate for racial harmony. And in 1960, the mayor of Indianapolis made him director of the local Human Rights Commission. For all the evil that was to come later in Jones's life, he actually did a lot of good in that role. This was still a time of stark division, with one set of rules for the city's white residents and another for everyone else. Jones worked tirelessly to break down those barriers, desegregating everything from the police department to the phone company. Jim's desire for a more tolerant world was evident in his personal life too. He and Marcelin adopted six children of various ethnicities to create what he questionably called his rainbow family. But whilst outwardly he appeared to be a paragon of virtue, Jones was growing increasingly paranoid. In 1961, he told his congregation he'd had visions that a nuclear strike would soon destroy Indianapolis. Convinced America's end was nigh, Jones travelled to Brazil in 1962 to search for a new home for the People's Temple. He settled in Rio de Janeiro, working in the city's slums, but his Brazilian break didn't last long. Jones was unable to find a suitable HQ for his fledgling cult, and back home in Indianapolis, which against all odds hadn't been wiped off the map in a hail of nukes, Jones's fickle followers were drifting away. Diminished attendance brought financial issues, and Jones was forced to sell several of the People's Temple assets, including the actual temple. Awkward. In 1965, he left Indianapolis behind for good, moving his family and remaining flock to Redwood Valley in California. Once settled in the Golden State, things started to get very dark very quickly. Jones continued to preach that the apocalypse was coming and all that crap, but now he also claimed to be the messiah sent to save the world. Despite fancying himself a divine incarnation, his actions said otherwise. He began taking copious amounts of drugs and his control over his remaining followers grew far more oppressive. New members of the People's Temple were forced to transfer all of their assets to the church and those who held day jobs gave their entire salaries to their new god. Jones controlled every aspect of their lives. He set food rations, approved sexual partners, and determined who could marry. As for his own needs, well, he took what he wanted, even if what he wanted happened to be married to another member of the temple. Jones set up an armed security unit to enforce his will, and those who went against him were subjected to increasingly severe punishments, including reduced food rations, public humiliation, and physical violence. As horrifying as all this was, Jones had only just begun. 
But no matter how outrageously he behaved privately, in public, his stardom continued to grow. This was the age of the hippie, a time of making love, not war, and as the smell of joss sticks floated across California, Jones's message of socialism and equality struck a chord. By 1970, the People's Temple had opened a branch in LA and moved their headquarters to the flower power capital of the West Coast, San Francisco. Membership grew steadily, and Jones and his disciples would brazenly seek new recruits from rival churches. Involvement in San Francisco politics allowed Jones to befriend numerous city politicians, and he courted the press, using an extensive network of contacts to guarantee good publicity. For him and his cult, <clears throat> I mean church. Despite the PR offensive, word was beginning to get out that the People's Temple wasn't quite the centre of virtue it seemed. As rumours of exploitation and abuse began to spread, Jones decided it was probably a good idea to move his flock far away from the eyes of the media and beyond the reach of the police. His destination of choice was, of all places, Guyana. The former British colony had a recently installed socialist government, and for Jones it was the perfect place to reshape the world in his image. You might think convincing a bunch of Americans to up sticks and relocate to the jungle to be ruled over by an abusive megalomaniac would be a hard sell. But people do some pretty weird things when they believe their immortal soul is at stake. So all told around a thousand faithful made the move. Cult-based colonies don't build themselves, you know, even if they are founded by the actual bloody messiah. So Jones soon put his loyal disciples to work, toiling in the fields 12 hours a day, six days a week. As a reward for all this hard labour, the people of Jonestown were given food rations that would have had your average supermodel reaching for the snack drawer. Nobody was allowed to leave, and anyone who spoke out about the appalling conditions would be sent to the medical unit, where they were dosed with mind-altering drugs, transforming them into walking zombies. Jones himself continued to pop a plethora of pills and potions, all of which made his paranoia soar to new heights. He was convinced that numerous enemies were out to destroy the church. So, along with their back-breaking manual labour and lack of food, the People's Temple congregation was subjected to military-style drills, including simulated attacks on the community. Guards hidden in the forest would fire on the commune, whilst Jones chanted nonsense over loudspeakers dotted around the place, whilst his terrified followers took up weapons and stood ready to repel these fictitious invaders. By November of 1978, abuse in Jonestown had become so widespread that the US government sent a team led by California Congressman Leo Ryan to investigate. The delegation included newspaper reporters, a TV crew, and relatives of some Jonestown inmates, <coughs> I mean residents. Jones took the intrusion in his stride, holding a small party for the outsiders. However, the facade of normalcy quickly crumbled. Many residents had concluded that Jones was not the messiah after all. And upon realising that he was just a very naughty boy, they saw the delegation as an opportunity to escape. But when Jones' more fanatical followers got wind of what was happening, one of them lost his shit and tried to stab the congressman. Unsurprisingly, the delegation decided it was time to get the hell out of there, taking 15 congregation members with them. But after hightailing it to a small airstrip a few miles outside of Jonestown, they were intercepted by Jones's personal militia. Armed men stormed the runway with all guns blazing, and by the time the bullets had stopped flying, Ryan and four of his team were dead. Horrific though this was, far worse was about to take place back in Jonestown. Jones knew that even by his own outlandish standards, this was it. You can't just gun down a politician and expect to be left to play God in the jungle. There would be no quiet relocation this time. The US authorities will come after him like a seagull after a bag of chips. So he took a drastic measure, something that's still hard to hear about even today, almost 50 years later. He rounded up his most trusted lieutenants and had them prepare a huge vat of the soft drink Flavorade, lacing it with a cocktail of drugs. Jones knew he'd lost, but if he was going down, he was going to take everyone else with him. 
Just in case you're still on the fence about what kind of a guy Jim Jones was, I mean, you probably aren't, but just in case, I can tell you he decreed that the congregation's children should be the first to drink the poison. Jones's own wife, Marceline, stepped in at this point in an attempt to stop the madness, but guards held her back. As the children began to die with their parents watching on, Marceline managed to break free, but it was already too late. Distraught, she grabbed a cup of the poison and was dead minutes later. In Jones's own words, it was a revolutionary suicide, a protest against the evils of the world. For many members of the People's Temple, it wasn't even a suicide, let alone revolutionary. The few survivors claimed that most people sat patiently, waiting for their turn to die. But a small minority refused to drink. Never one to take no for an answer, Jones had his goons pin them down and inject cyanide into their bloodstreams. In the space of just 45 minutes, a staggering 909 people were dead, 276 children amongst them. Jones was found with his followers, a bullet hole in his head. Whether he committed suicide or was murdered by one of his flock, nobody knows for sure. Either way, the People's Temple was no more. In the years since the massacre, there have been many cult leaders who've preyed on the good intentions and misguided faith of their own followers to line their pockets and fulfill their own warped fantasies. But for sheer force of personality, size of ambition, and eventual scale of devastation, few have come close to the sunglasses wearing second coming that was Reverend Jim Jones. And thank God for that. Thanks for watching.